Okay guys, welcome to the next part of our conversation here in this module where we're been dealing with spanning tree. And what I want to do is I want to illustrate a particular point here and that is, is the behavior of what's happening between cat 1 and cat 2 in our topology. So again, I'll just draw this out real quick. We have cat 1 connected to cat 2. And what we have is we have in this infrastructure two links. We have 0, 023 on both ends and 0, 024 on both ends as the interfaces that we're using to interconnect these devices. When we look at this, what we're going to find is, is one of these devices, and I can't remember which, is going to be the root bridge for VLAN 20. And I think it's going to be this switch right here. It's going to be CAT2. So CAT2 is the root bridge for VLAN 20. Let's double check that just to make sure. So on CAT2, all I'm going to do is say show VLAN or show spanning tree for VLAN 20. And in this scenario, yes, I am the root bridge. Now what we're going to find here is, is that on this switch, we can very clearly see that each of these individual ports are forwarding and designated. Now that means designated ports lead away from the root bridge. So obviously all ports on the root bridge are going to lead away from it, so that's going, not going to be an issue. What we want to do is we're going to take the opportunity to go over to CAT1 and look at what's happening here because what we're going to find is CAT1 is going to be allowing traffic, it's going to designate a root bridge pointing towards the root, I mean, a root port pointing towards the root bridge, and it's going to be blocking traffic on this interface because of the simple fact that we are going to not want to induce the possibility of a loop in our infrastructure. So on cat1, again, we'll repeat that command. We will say, do show spanning tree for VLAN 20. And now let's look and see what we have configured here. Notice, like I said, port 23 would be the root port forwarding. Port 24 will be blocking. Now when we look at how this is implemented and how this is actually being deployed in our scenario, what we want to realize is, is that we've lost half of our throughput between these devices simply by a direct result of the fact that this configuration calls for us to block traffic on one of these links to prevent a loop. Now there's another way for us to be able to get around this and that's going to be to, to employ a technology referred to as an ether channel. So an ether channel, sometimes called port channels, allow us to bundle interfaces. So now, instead of having two interfaces, what we would do is we'd combine these two interfaces into a virtual interface called a port channel. We'll give it a number. And then what happens is we're going to make these interfaces members of this port channel and spanning tree is going to run on that port channel itself. So in other words, we're not going to be blocking any ports because spanning tree is going to run on the virtual interface, which is going to be composed of all the individual member interfaces. So let's take a look at exactly how we would configure that on cat one. What we'll do is we'll come in here and we're going to say, first of all, I'm going to go ahead and just be safe and I'm going to default my interfaces on FAO so default interface range FAO 0, 23, 224. Do the same thing on CAT 2. Default interface range FA 0, 23, 224. Now we'll cut back over to CAT 1. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say interface range FA 0, 23, 224. I'm going to say switch port mode Switch port trunk encapsulation dot one Q. Switch port trunk mode trunk. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shut these interfaces down. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say channel group. And I'm going to say 12 to give it a mode. I'm just going to say mode on. Now what ended up happening here is it ended up creating a virtual interface called port channel 12. Let's take a look at that. Do show run section 
port channel 12. Do, do show run interface PO12. Do show face FAO 23 and FAO 24. Now notice my error recovery script has finally started working. It's waiting 30 seconds and it's resetting it. Let me go ahead and fix that because that's getting to be annoying. So what we'll say here is, is we'll take the bridge group command off. We'll shut it and we'll no shut it. It's always best to wait for the console to tell us about the shutdown before we no shut it. And then we'll go back over to Cat1 and Cat1 should now be stable should come up and stay up. Now, let's go over to CAT2 and do the matching configuration. Interface, range, FA0, 23, 224. Switch port, trunk, incap.1q. Switch port, mode, trunk. Channel group, 12, mode, on. And we'll talk about mode shortly. Do show, run, section, PO, or not section, interface, PO12. All right, there's our interface. So right now what I want to do is I'm going to cut back over to Cat1 and I'm going to no-shut these interfaces again. So I'm going to bring everything back up and make everything operational. And let's see what ends up happening. Notice that my member links, 23 and 24, come up and become operational. Notice that my port channel changed this mode to up. So now that it's going to be configured and operational, do show run interface PO12. What am I going to see now? Notice that the port channel actually adopted all of the configuration that I had on the individual links themselves. So now what I can do is I can do show ether channel summary and what I'll see here in the confines of the ether channel summary is telling me that I have port channel 12 that is switching. It is going to be in use and I can see FAO 23 and FAO 24 are participating in the bundle. Now, the cool part about this, too, is, is the fact that if I come up here and say show spanning tree for VLAN 20, what I'm going to see now is, is that rather than blocking ports, I'm actually running the spanning tree protocol on the actual virtual interface that I just got finished creating. And these protocols are going to be, the spanning tree protocol is not going to be blocking ports now. Now what we also want to recognize here is, is also we still have just a little bit more theory that we need to recognize. Now that means that the theory that I want to point out here is the fact that we have different ways to create port channels. So method one is going to be using a Cisco proprietary method. Cisco proprietary. That method is referred to as PAG-P, Port Aggregation Protocol. We have a standard solution to do it that's referred to as LACP, Link Aggregation Control Protocol. Now we also have an option to do it statically. And that's what I did before. I just come up and said on on one side. Now these protocols that we're going to use, PAGP or LACP, are going to dynamically negotiate this ether channel configuration that we have. And what we're going to find is, is that we're going to be able to use static to just simply turn it on. So the issue here is if there's a problem with static, it's not going to allow us to be able to auto-negotiate it. And since PAGP is Cisco proprietary, there is no I, uh, IEEE standard governing it. However, in the confines of LACP, LACP is actually governed, again, by uh, the IEEE standards. And the IEEE standard is 802.3AD. So 802.3AD is the specification that covers everything we need to know about LACP. Now when we start looking at this, the main thing that we want to understand is, is there's different ways that we can actually form these relationships. So first of all, let's go again and just make a chart. We have on, we have desirable and we have auto. 
Now this is defining the Cisco proprietary PAG-P protocol. Actually, I always do that wrong. It's PAG little g P. Now that means we have on down here on the on the downward we have desirable and we have auto. So when we look at this in a matrix, what we're going to find here is, is that we will form a relationship if both sides are on. If it's on and desirable, we will form no peering. If it's on and auto, we will form no peering. If it's desirable and on, we will form no peering. If it's desirable and desirable, we will form a peering. If it's desirable and auto, we will form a peering. If it's auto and on, no peer. If it's auto and desirable, we will peer. And if it's auto and auto, there will not be a peering. The whole idea here is this desirable means that I'm going to go ahead and initiate a connection where auto says, okay, if someone else initiates, I'm going to go ahead and participate. And this is going to govern the creation of an actual PAG-P Cisco proprietary ether channel communication. Now on the confines of LACP, we have pretty much the same scenario, except what we're going to find here is, is that the system is going to give us the option to use different commands. So LACP is going to give me on, and then it's going to give me active, and then it's going to give me passive. So again, on, active, and passive. We build our table, and what we're going to find here is on and on will give us a link, on and active will not give us a link, on and passive will not give us a link. Active and on, no link, active and passive, link, active and passive, I'm sorry, active and active link, active and passive will give us a link. Passive and on will not give us a link, passive and active will give, it, will give us a link, and passive and passive will not get us a link. So the outcome is the same no matter how we slice it in the confines of how our devices are going to be interconnecting and how we're going to be operating using these ether channels. Now the thing that I want to point out here is, is that when we create an ether channel things like our duplex settings, our speeds, anything that is going to do with like native VLANs, all of those values have to be the same, which is why I did the default interface range command on 23 to 24 in order to zeroize it so that I would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that everything had the same configuration. And we also have to make certain that that extends to whether or not we're using this for the purposes of, of trunks or if we're using this for the purposes of access connections. So again, keeping in mind all of these elements, what we want to do now is we want to talk about not just the configuration, but we need to again go through this idea of the variation or the, the verification. So in this scenario, if I could, like I did before, let me go ahead and select my arrow here, I could come up and say show ether channel summary and that's going to give me a list of my ether channel participants. I could come up here and I could say show interface port channel 12. And what's that, what that's going to give me is output very similar to the things that I've been seeing. It's going to let me know what my state is. I'm up, up, I'm connected. It's going to give me my MAC address that's been assigned to that particular link and everything that I need to know in order to make certain that everything is up and operational. Now another way that I could be able to verify this is to make certain that we have the interconnections all in place. Now I'm not, the chart is the chart. The chart is going to be how we're going to do our negotiation. Static in any dynamic mode is not going to negotiate anything. Active and active will negotiate links. <clears throat> desirable, desirable will. The only scenario is, is if I have auto or passive on both ends, I'm not going to get a link. So that's pretty much pretty simple to understand and that's going to bring us to our conclusion here where we're talking about this confines of this idea of ether channel configuration. So with that being accomplished, I'll see you guys in the next video.